final thing, normally I talk a lot about anthropomorphism of AI, and I, that's not this talk, but just algorithms are not the actors. It is not that algorithms are doing things to us, it's that people are doing things with algorithms to us. I always remember the people on the other side. Even though some of these uh, outcomes were not expected, it is still the obligations of the agencies that, that create the algorithms uh, to handle what their machines are doing. All right, so uh, I was introduced as a professor of ethics and technology. I just want to assure you that I also have a PhD in AI, and I have two undergraduate degrees, well, not undergraduate, a master's degree in psychology. And so I thought for this talk, I would come from the perspective of my actual blue sky science to start, and then to move into where the social media came from. So my original interests were about cognition. When do we use intelligence and when do we not use intelligence? Why do some species use intelligence more than other species? There's lots of trees. You know, people that are afraid of AI taking over, like explain why the trees have, you know, are doing so well. Right? Bacteria are still doing extremely well. Right? So intelligence is not everything. Um, what I uh, came to realize as I started looking at the different species is that if you are a species that uses uh, intelligence as a strategy, one of the most important parts of that strategy is sharing the, the, the outcomes. So there are basically, the more cognitive you are as a species, uh, the more likely you are to uh, have culture, that, that you share information uh, at least as a group and, and a set of strategies, for example, for feeding. And in particular, that uh, we were looking at why is there only one species with language? Well, you can think of language and culture itself as a public good. All right, so then I started studying public goods. When do people contribute to public goods? When do people not contribute to public goods? It turns out, so do you know what a public good is? A public good is something that a community shares. So if you're used to thinking like in a Darwinian sense that everybody's fighting and only one can win, that's not how the way the world works. By and large, if you get a bunch of people together and they work together on certain kinds of projects, then there can literally be more people, right? We, there are more, there's more biomass on the planet now that we've gotten good at producing energy out of, uh, well, petrochemical and other sources, right? So there literally can be an increase in the number of people who can live if we figure out things like new agricultural techniques. So that's like a public good and the problem is that in some parts of the world, people don't believe in public goods. They talk about zero-sum games. And I, I don't want to say that the, it isn't just parts of the world, and that's part of the research we've shown. You have different beliefs in every community, but you have more people thinking that there are only zero-sum games, that, that is disbelieving in public goods, in areas that have low GDP and low rule of law. Now, now GDP, the, the measure of the economy, and the rule of law, uh, are highly, highly correlated, right? So it's hard to tell which of those is causing which. And you can even think of the rule of law as a public good. Again, if we have a good rule of law, first of all, we have to all contribute and, and, and help maintain the rule of law. But secondly, it's easier for us to build things together communally and, and share them, right? So again, there's this, this cycle. <clears throat> okay. So there's been two high-impact uh, consequences of my research in this area that came out in the last few years. And the reason that I brought all that up first is that there was supposed to be some discussion of bias on this panel. And I was uh, one of the three people who had the paper in Science in 2017 about the fact that artificial intelligence, when it's trained by machine learning, which not all AI is, but if it's trained by machine learning off of normal human language, will have the same implicit biases that humans have, right? So that was my insight. It was my, I thought, as soon as I found out about implicit bias in the, like, the about 2000, I thought, I bet you could get that from large corpus linguistics, which is what we used to call it back then. But it took me a long time to get to the point where it, I was not a natural language researcher, and it was when I was on sabbatical at Princeton that we had enough resources to pursue what I'd been pursuing with undergraduates really at the top level and get it into science. However, one of my colleagues, who was up for tenure the next year, Arvind Narayanan, completely panicked at all this incredible stuff. Do you know this about the, the, that you see the racism and sexism in, in the language, right? So he checked and it turns out that, that the implicit bias that we were able to measure with AI that was in the language perfectly correlated with the actual way the world worked, 
So it's sexist to think that, um, that, that women aren't programmers, right? But the extent to which those word embeddings that were sexist thought that, that being programmer was a male was highly correlated to the proportion of programmers that were male, okay? So what that tells us is that the things we've decided are negative stereotypes are the parts of our lived reality that we want to change, all right? And that was already a controversy people have been having for decades, and we showed that because of AI. We were able to measure what was going on by seeing how people wrote onto the web, okay? So that was one thing that was really important. Um, <clears throat> and I think the other thing that was really important I was uh, leading into um, by this discussion of the fact that there's different strategies, okay? So we, with, with colleagues looking at international data, we showed that when you have the opportunity to invest in a public good, but you're playing with a group of people, you're all able to do that. Some people, especially in sort of the global north here, uh, are very likely to punish anyone who isn't uh, contributing enough to the public good. But some people uh, just ignore everybody else. That happens a lot in America, actually. <laughs> And some people attack people who contribute to the public good. And what our, our studies have shown is that actually those people who are attacking those who are contributing to the public good, including their own wealth, they're attacking everyone. <laughs> so they're actually playing this very competitive game. And now I bring that up in the context of the social media because this is one of the big allegations that we saw from Chris Wiley about what happened with Cambridge Analytica, okay? So what he said, was we were hired to go out and find people who had felt like they're kind of isolated and then put them into the room together. And this was in places that were having ISIS and whatever, right? So they would find people that thought like their funders thought, get them to go to the same coffee shop. And then those guys would say, hey, there's lots of people that think like me. And then they would go out and they would actually act because they felt more empowered because they realized they were a group, all right? And, and that was one of the things that, um, that, that the people working on this public goods work had said, was we think the reason there's lower uh, public goods investment in these poorer areas is people are less likely to think that they're in a group with whoever some random scientist has put them in the room with. If you're all at Harvard and you say, oh, we're all at Harvard, hey, we're, we're, we're Harvard people. But if you're all at, at somewhere else, in Minsk or somewhere, you might not think that you might think, oh, there's people in this room that are from some other group, okay? So the, 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 I, I'm, I'm bringing this up because I, I was just in this context uh, with, there are scientists who are saying, look, there's no way social media is changing political opinions. We've done lots of measurements. It doesn't matter what people see, they still believe the same thing. That's not the point. We did know that. There is sometimes some shifts, incidentally, but that the main point of what we saw with the Chris Wiley allegations and what we've seen with a lot of other allegations is that you're convincing people that they have power or you're convincing people that they're disempowered and they may as well stay home. There's no reason for you to choose between the two candidates because they're both out to screw you. Sorry, I said that. <laughs> they're all out to attack you, they're not helping you. And so you may as well vote for a, for a splinter group or you may as well just stay home. So uh, I think there's been a lot of science, science, well, that's been misinterpreted. It is actually proper science. The other thing is that when you have a highly polarized society, then you are also likely to get these very close elections. And so I literally had one of these guys who said, there is, uh, there, there's no impact of, of social media campaigns, who said, well, there's at most 4%. Well, Brexit was 2%, right? Trump won by like 40,000 votes. There was four states that was like 10,000 one state, 10,000 the other state, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, 20,000, okay? So that's way less than 4%. If you can pick which are the states that are gonna be close, then you know it's worth investing in trying to get that shift anyway, all right? So I hope that I'm being clear. And, ooh, wow, I'm doing very well at getting through my notes. Um, yeah, so I talked about Chris Wiley. I, I'm going to rattle off a few other studies because I still have uh, five minutes left in my, in my uh, thing here. Um, so uh, th there, there's a really important study, I think, 
and I can't read my own handwriting, uh, Kyle Mikado and Marco Canopaki. And if, I'll tweet it afterwards if you guys don't know the study. But they showed that WhatsApp had been literally weaponized in the Brazilian election. You know, this stuff didn't start, stop with Trump, right? So WhatsApp is supposed to be peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not supposed to be broadcast like Twitter or, or uh, Facebook, right? But in fact, they showed, and again, you could say, oh, no evidence. We don't know for a fact that each of these new people that came online and then propagated the, the viral videos, the carefully constructed viral videos, we don't know for a fact whether they're people or sock bucket puppets, but gee, they started exactly 90 seconds apart from each other. <laughs> like thousands, tens of thousands of them. It's, it's pretty good evidence, right? And, and uh, so part of the problem here is thinking of what is valid evidence. But anyway, they, every single uh, WhatsApp group that you could get into, and these people, um, they, they created the sock puppets, got them into every WhatsApp group, and then broadcast, all right? And then propagated. So by the day of the election, Every single WhatsApp group, whether it was supposed to be about gardening or it was supposed to be about the opposition, it was showing pro the populist candidate videos. There were, there were, there were members of those supposedly peer-to-peer -peer groups sh broadcasting the information, right? So that's been extremely well documented. I believe there's also some really nice stuff on the Indian election, but I can't give you those citations. Um, Alex Stewart and colleagues, uh, cover of nature about gerrymandering minds showed that you can completely disrupt people's natural ability to create consensus by just having a, f a relatively small number of bots inserted at the correct point in the social networks. And again, it's easy to detect the social networks if you look at Twitter or something. Very, very easy. So um, uh, Andrew Guess and colleagues showed that, well, first of all, a number of people, and I forget another name, Michael uh, Sharkov was the most recent one that just came out, but I've seen a lot of studies showing that social media itself doesn't cause polarization, right? It's not just the use of it that's correlated. But Andrew Guess and colleagues did a really interesting study that showing that who was propagating extremist content on uh, social media, it was mostly older people on Facebook. <laughs> you know, at least that was the American election. So those were the people that were vulnerable to, the, to these, uh, these uh, weird uh, things that were getting posted. They had a bunch of other interesting uh, findings too. But the vast, actually one thing I will also mention, if you ask people what they're reading, they were saying they're reading this extreme right and left because you're in a social con context. They were saying, oh yeah, I only read this. But in fact, if you look and see what they're clicking on and what they're reading, they're all reading normal central mail news. They want to know what's actually going on and they're, they're just reporting what they're doing to, as an identity indicator. So you have to be very careful about what sources of information you're taking when you're looking at this stuff. But one of the, I'll, I'll mention this too, I've still got a minute, so I'll say, <laughs> one of the things that uh, impressed me the most before the 2016 election that was frightening me was some of the Microsoft research on Connect. They can recognize who you're going to vote for by whether you look at the television commercial. They can also see when you're gonna get divorced. Connect is a, it's a game interface, but it's, it's tracking everybody in the room and people have these things sitting in their houses. So the information is out there and we know that the, the kinds of manipulations I've been describing are doable. And, and, I, and I'm uh, very annoyed by the people who are saying, we know for certain social media didn't throw the elections. Most of those people are, are mistranslating that we haven't been able to concrete prove but not knowing is not the same as knowing the opposite, okay? But we have a lot of very good evidence. We just need to figure out how to aggregate that there is, of course, these manipulations happening and there is an assault on democracy. Okay. Thank you, Joanna. Um, that was fascinating. Um, just a very quick follow-up question for me, which may not actually be all that quick. I know in this room there are um, a lot of people that are very keen on social media regulation. Um, a lot of people do seem to agree that social networks should be regulated. And as um, a professor of, of ethics, what do you think should be um, some of the ethical guiding principles that should <laughs> inform um, our potential or upcoming regulation of social networks? Oh, that, 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 that. 
So I, uh, I used to be a professor of AI, and then I, if, if I could have chosen my chair, it would have been technology and policy, but it was called technology and ethics, which is much sexier. But now I feel like I have to go vegan and things, you know, it's like, like a <laughs> professor of ethics, okay. Uh, but um, it, it's been interesting. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, the main things that I would see, I guess, from the ethical perspective are uh, I worry about nudging. So, so nudging without, nudging with consent is okay. If people say, I want to be nudged, that's great if they're adults. But the, the extent to which, but we sort of have to, there is leadership. But just at least having some level of transparency about how all this stuff happens. So I really want uh, that people, that we know how and why uh, decisions were made and that people can find them out. Not everyone will bother to, but everyone should know how they could if they spent extra time or who they should call. When incidentally, that's one of my uh, current theories I'm working on. We're not going to get people to trust government again until we uh, increase social mobility again. Mm. Because it is about knowing who you can trust, what you establish when you're at school, like who, which of your classmates you trust, and then seeing who they trust, right? So we need to have some of your classmates winding up working for Google so you can find out what the inside scoop is. Um, so uh, I do very much worry about the freedom of thought stuff. So freedom of thought, freedom of opinion. Um, how do we d protect people to form and have uh, different interesting opposing opinions? But yet also cope with the fact that we're in a completely uh, new world of, of rapid information transformation and so leadership has taken more meaning. But I just, I just, I think we will be a lot better off if we, we were explicitly aware and we can somehow make people vis visible to people the extent who is actually doing the leading. And, and people want that. They, they say, yes, we want to know who paid for the ads we see and how the ads were chosen. Um, and there hasn't been adequate stuff to, you know, this is a great, so regulating Facebook is always fun. So Facebook now shows you, if you say, how is this ad chosen for me? You can go in and you can see like one of the things. But if there was a whole lot of criteria that were paid for, the only criteria they'll show you is the one that, um, th that already applied to most other people. Facebook won't show you the one that was most targeted to you. They'll show you the least targeted to you mm. thing. So the, it, it's tricky, but. One other thing that, that you brought up is that um, the polarization that we're seeing online is very much the result of the offline polarization that, that's, that's happening in, in, in um, our political context. Do you think technology, um, algorithms, social media platforms could be used as, uh, as uh, vectors of change and we could try and depolarize ourselves online to maybe then well, have, have that fixed offline as well? <laughs> yeah, well, the, uh, to some extent, communication is the vector of everything. So yes, it could be used. I, um, again, uh, coming out of the public goods work I've done, it turns out that um, uh, polarization is highly, highly correlated with inequality. So I think that as long as we keep allowing regulatory capture and extremely powerful individuals uh, to, to create false scarcities, when people's uh, uh, well-being is in decline or when they believe it's in decline, if they, if they see themselves as falling, that's when they get afraid and they go into identity politics. It's a defensive mechanism, which we can even see in other species. It's a normal thing that if you're falling behind, you're afraid you aren't gonna live. And so then you tribalize it, because it's like a time when there's gonna be a fight between tribes. So I think we need to both um, address the inequality problems, make sure people are doing better, and then make sure they notice that they're doing better, which is this other problem that, that's somewhat uh, tied up into it but I don't think only communication by itself without addressing the fundamental problems is, is, is enough. <laughs>